couple of weeks ago, we made our way through these various texts, Matthew 24, 21, Matthew 24, 29 and 31, Daniel 12, Daniel 9, and Revelation 3, and verse number 10. And making, again, the distinction between the terms tribulation versus the tribulation. And that the word tribulation is going to appear in your New Testament and the, uh, is going to appear all 12 or 15 times uh, at various places um, with regard to even in the parable of the sower. Uh, uh, the word tribulation appears there. The word tribulation appears uh, in a number of ways. Uh, but it, as a general rule, it just means persecution, great persecution. Whereas in a handful of instances... We have the tribulation or the great tribulation uh, that, uh, uh, that the Bible speaks about, which is different than tribulation in general. And the passages in Matthew 24, 21, 24, 29, uh, the 31, are obviously passages that refer to a period of time, a specific period of time pertaining to a period of intense Tribulation that was unlike any other before or after. And working our way through the text, we know uh, that, uh, that in Matthew 24, that the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of by Daniel, would be seen by those that were then living. It would take place in their lifetimes. And, uh, and we noted that Luke's account, a uh, parallel account, you have Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 and verse 20. And uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, gospel accounts are parallel in regard to they're talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And Luke and, and uh, Matthew speak of this abomination of desolation. And Luke explains what that abomination is. Uh, in Luke 21 20 says, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its desolation is nigh. And so the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel in Daniel 9, 24 to 27 is the destruction of Jerusalem by these armies. And those that would witness that were commanded to flee. They're told to run in Matthew. They're told to run in Luke. They're told to run in Mark. And so these are things that would have taken place in the first century. Just as an aside, and, and I'm just throwing this out purely as speculation, the Gospel of John makes no mention whatsoever of these things. No mention whatsoever of any of these things. Wonder why not? Already happened. That's right. John's Gospel was one of the last books of the New Testament that had ever that was ever written, and it happened after the fact. And there was no need to write people who had already seen it to warn them to watch out for it. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all written before A.D. seventy, and John's Gospel was written after. Therefore, there is no mention of these things. I just find that to be something that a lot of people tend to overlook as they think about what the New Testament says about it. If, you know, if Matthew, Mark, and Luke spoke in such great detail, I mean, all of Matthew 24 for the first 36 verses, you know, and all, a extensive section of, of Mark 13 through about verse 30, and then the Luke 21, and all this extensive talk about it, and then John doesn't say a word about it. Doesn't say a word about it. And Bobby got it exactly right because it had already happened when John wrote his gospel and therefore there was no need to even mention it. And so uh, the Bible is clear that what Daniel is talking about in Daniel 9 took place in AD, in AD 70. But your assignment for this week was to do what? Does anybody remember? What was your assignment this week? Take it by your silence that you didn't do it. <laughs> what was our assignment for this week? We're gonna look up we're gonna look up two things. 
We're going to look up two things and look at them. What was one of them? There you go. That's right. We're going to look at the, the passages associated with the tribulation and not simply tribulation in general, the specifics to the, to, uh, the tribulation. And what else, Dwayne? The Antichrist. The Antichrist. The Antichrist. Yeah, that's that fellow Walter was talking about. All right. Now, I gave you a hint about the Antichrist, about finding him, didn't I? <laughs> What did I tell you? What did I tell you about finding the Antichrist? Well, Andy means again, so... Yeah, but what did I tell you about finding him in the Bible? I told you where not to look. He wouldn't be in Revelation. There you go, Rhonda. That is exactly right. He's not going to be in the book of Revelation, and yet if you were to ask nine out of five people, they'd say he's in the book of Revelation. You walk down the street, nine times out of five, they'll say that the Antichrist is in the book of Revelation. And he ain't there. He's not there. Where did we say we're going to find him? In John. John's epistles. All right, in John's epistles. And in fact, John has three epistles. And the Antichrist, or the term Antichrist, is mentioned in two of those three epistles. But, let's begin with this the tribulation. Now, I don't know how well this marker is going to show up. Alright. The tribulation or the great tribulation. Alright. Now, our first references are going to be right where we, right where we ended up. Matthew 24. All right, verses 21 and 29. And your parallels will be Mark 13, 19, and Luke 21, 20 and follow. All right, we're not going to spend much time here on this because we've already spent the last two or three sessions studying these verses, right? What is the, what is the, I guess I should say, uh, historically speaking, historically speaking, what are these passages talking about? The destruction of Jerusalem, that's right. The destruction of Jerusalem. All right, and when did that happen? AD seven. All right, so we got. We're going to get all our. We're going to get all of our Jesus passages out of the way. Well, I mean, you can. You're going to know. You're going to find the term here and here, and then in these parallel accounts. But there's no sense in walking through all the parallel accounts since we know they're parallel accounts. All right. So we've got, uh, as best I can tell, two other two other texts both of which are in the book of Revelation. So open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Alright. Chapter 1 and verse number 9. Revelation 1 and verse 9. What do we find? What do we find concerning <clears throat> tribulation in this text? There we go, and that, if we were playing charades, I'd give you one of these right here, right on the nose. John was a companion in the tribulation. The tribulation. Now, some some of your uh, uh, what's your say? In tribulation. It says in tribulation. That's what I was fixing to say. Some uh, uh, texts d 
do not read the tribulation. They just say your companion <coughs> in tribulation and in the kingdom. But the definite article is in the Greek text. The text reads in the tribulation and the kingdom and patience of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the is there even though, even though it's not always translated. Kind of like in Galatians 3.26. You know, most, tra most translations don't say the faith. It says, you're all the sons of God by faith, which is in Christ. And people say, well, see there, you're, you're a child of God by faith. Faith only. Except that the definite article is there. You're all the sons of God through the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So it's a system of faith and not faith itself. So the definite article is there. And John says he was their companion in it. He was their companion in it. Which means he was a partaker of it. Now John was exiled on the island of Patmos when he wrote the book of Revelation. So John did not have to flee the tribulation because John had already been exiled to that island uh, prior to to the tribulation. Now, not everybody believes it. If you, I say, if you, if a person takes, if a person takes a late date for the Book of Revelation, right? A lot of people believe the Book of Revelation was written sometime around A.D. Uh, ninety-five to ninety-seven, right? If you take that view, then this won't work. He can't be in the he can't be in the tribulation because it would have already been well past by the time he wrote the book. But you know me, I've already told you I believe that the text indicates that the book of Revelation was written prior to <coughs> AD 70. That the that the events of AD 70 are foretold in the first 16 chapters of the book of Revelation. And therefore, that's why John said in chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, what did he say about the things that he was writing about? What did he say? Say it, Kyle. They must shortly take place. John says, the things that I'm writing to you are fixing to happen. If he's a southerner, that's what he wrote. They're fixing to happen. Right? They're nigh. Shortly must take place. So whatever John's talking about, they're on the very precipice of those events. All right? And so I think Revelation, uh, I think Revelation 1 through 16 matches up very nicely with Matthew 24 and these other texts. Uh, and we can talk about that when we come back. If, if you guys want to talk about that aspect of the book of Revelation... I'd be happy to, to lay that out and give you some handout material. So, you know, maybe that will tell us when we're going to come back on February the 12th. All right? But John said these things must shortly come to pass. And so that's why I believe that th this particular book of Revelation was written before AD 70, reminding the Christians about those things and encouraging encouraging them that the victory belongs to the, to the church at all, always. No matter what happens to us in our bodies, the victory ultimately belongs to us. And so Revelation 1 9, John said he was their companion. Okay? He was their companion in the tribulation and kingdom, which also tells us what about the kingdom? What does it tell us about the kingdom? Already come. Already come. All right. Where are, what do our premillennial friends say about the kingdom? It's not come yet. Not come yet. And yet John says he's in it. Right? That's pretty plain. I'm your companion in the tribulation and the kingdom. And patience of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the kingdom uh, had indeed arrived. So, uh, uh, so the tribulation and kingdom is, is uh, conversant with a pre-AD 70 a pre-80-70 uh, state. Now, the other passage is Revelation 7 
and verse 14, where John is seeing visions. And he sees a vision in Revelation chapter 7. And begins in, really begins in verse, and begins in verse one. He says, "After these things I saw," and then in verse nine, "And after these things I looked, and behold," and he talks about some things that he saw, and says, "One of the elders in verse thirteen, one of the twenty-four elders said, "Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from?" And John says, "You know, you know, you tell me." And what does he say? These are the ones who come out of what? Great the great tribulation. And have washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are those that have come out. Come out of the great well, too, you got to remember every time they write wide in there, it means they cleared yourself up or got right or whatever. That's exactly right. He's talking about he's talking about those that he's talking about those that have come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. What's that mean? What did they do? Come remember the church. Came remember the church. Obeyed the gospel. And became washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's what happens when we obey the gospel. We're washed. In the blood of the Lamb. But it appears to me <coughs> that this is still yet in the future. Because John is seeing it. I, you, know, you don't get a vision about things that's happened before. You get a vision about what? What's going on? Things that are going to happen in the future. And so John is seeing a vision about those who have come out of the great tribulation. Which would lead again to say before 87. Because we know that the great tribulation, that the great tribulation is all associated with Matthew 24 and the destruction of Jerusalem. So the point is, there are very, very, very few passages that make mention of the great tribulation. And the lion's share of those passages are found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are known as the synoptics. Synoptic meaning similar. They follow the same pattern of, 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 of narrative. And so you're going to get six or eight mentions, but they're all going to be in the narratives of the Gospels. And so it's not eight different mentions. It's eight mentions of the same account in three different books. Then you have these two mentions in Revelation 1, 9 and Revelation 7 and verse 14. And other than that, the Bible just doesn't have anything to say about it. Uh, the Bible uh, warns about great uh, persecution, right? I mean, 2 Peter, 1 and 2 Peter is written to prepare people for tribulation. And, and in all likelihood, the tribulation. The tribulation. But, you know, remember when we went back and we, we threw up the verses and so, you know, we typed in what verses teach about the tribulation. And about every verse in the, in the New Testament that just had the word in it, tribulation was thrown up there. I said they're not making the distinction between tribulation <coughs> and the tribulation. And so there's, there are those, all right? Now, let's go to Antichrist over here. Antichrist. Antichrist is going to get about five mentions. Five mentions in all the New Testament. Four of those mentions are going to be in the book of 1 John. And the last one's going to be in the book of 2 John. Verse 7. 2 John only has one chapter, so it's going to be found in verse 7. But the first mention of Antichrist is in 1 John 2... <coughs> And I believe it's in verse 18. Check me on that. You're going to find it two times in verse 18. So 1 John 2, <coughs> verse 18. says, you have heard that what? 
I heard. And by the way, I should have checked that to see if the uh, see if the the definite article is there. I don't think it is because I think in, I think that in First John two eighteen, does anybody have the word the in front of Antichrist in yeah. in eighteen? Yeah. All right. Does anybody have it in italics? See, I've got, I've got the Antichrist. I've got the New King James. I've got the Antichrist. But there are some manuscripts that don't have the word the in it. All right? That don't have the word the. So you have heard that Antichrist is coming. Or the Antichrist. Not that it makes a big difference because John's fixing to clear all of it up. Whether or not they're talking about one person or one thing or, or one system, you've heard that it <coughs> is coming. Okay? You've heard it is coming, which means what? It's future, right? You've heard that it is coming. But I say what? But I say, by the way, he's pretty good authority, right? He's an inspired writer. But I say, what's the, word, what's the next word, Ryan? Many. Many. Next word, yeah. have, what tense is that? It's past, or past, or it's already happened. Could mean present, but it's not future. Many have what? Many have come. Okay, present perfect. But it means it's already happened. Present means it it, 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 it has happened and it, continu and it continues to be happening. Started happening. Started happening and is still happening. Now. Started happening in the past and is still happening now. Is that right? Okay. He says, many have come. And then, what's the next line say? Therefore, Therefore we know what? It is, the last hour. it is the last hour or the last time. All right. All of our premillennial friends are saying, "Oh, we're almost in the last days, the last times." There are signs that are leading us to the last times. And two thousand years ago, John said, "Everything you see right now that I'm telling you about is indication that it's already here. You know that it." is the last time or the last hour. Right? That's what it says. So by this, by this, that many have already come, we know it is the last hour or time. All right? Now we've moved down in our text. I believe it's down to verse... 22? What's verse 22 say? Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Stop. Read that section again. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? All right. Now, the reason I had you stop is, is that the rest of our mentions, the rest of our mentions of Antichrist are going to surround that concept right there. In other words, John is fixing to explain what all this is about. He who denies that Jesus is the Christ, now keep reading, Ryan. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. All right, that's 1 John 2. 22. What does he do? He denies that Jesus is the Christ. And, I, and what I believe is also a parallel, Bobby, I think that when he says it again, when he says he that denies the Father and Son, I think it's say, is, is, a, is an expansion of this thought right here. Denies Father and the Son. 
That is Antichrist. It's me. Yes, ma'am. In verse 18. Uh-huh. My version makes more sense because it doesn't say the Antichrist. Because it doesn't really make sense to say the Antichrist because then he says there are many Antichrists. So saying the Antichrist sounds like there's one. But if there's many, then I don't understand why it says the Antichrist. All right. In John's case, in John's case, I think that there were there was a misunderstanding about the teaching of Antichrist. So therefore, I think it, it would make sense for him to say, you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, but what I'm telling you is that many have already come. So I, Mine doesn't read like that. I know, but what, I, what I'm saying is some, some of the passages have the word the in them, and some of them don't. But mine doesn't even say, but I say, it doesn't say any of that. What's it say? Mine says, as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists. We know that it's the last time. Okay. I mean, to me, there's no the Antichrist. It's no I say, these. it's just Antichrist is coming. I mean, but, but what he said, what he says, but even now, many antichrists. Have, in other, the, but I'm saying what I'm saying. Yeah, I understand. This is this is not in, in in that text. But my point is, you've heard, but I don't understand why people today get that confused. Though, if it says there are many antichrists, listen, you I'm with you. Want. I'm with you. I don't know why people keep talking about antichrist, the antichrist, because the Bible never talks about the antichrist. As a singular figure, and John John makes it clear: anyone that denies Jesus is the Christ is what antichrist. antichrist. He didn't say anybody that denies Jesus is the Christ is the antichrist. He says anybody that denies Jesus is the Christ is antichrist. Which means what, Walter? What's antichrist mean? Against, against Christ or against Jesus? Right. So, so John, John, is, John is correcting this idea of any singular figure known as the Antichrist. He corrects it in verse 19. He says there's many of them. And he says, and here's who they are. Anybody that denies Jesus is the Christ is Antichrist. Now let's go to 1 John chapter 4. And verse number 3. This is going to be our fourth of five mentions. And I promise you I'm going to get you out of here Shortly, this is not going to take long. All right, somebody read me First John four verse three. What? What do they do? Any anyone that does not do what? Anyone that does not confess Jesus does not. Confess <coughs> Jesus is what? Not from, God. Not from God. Then where is it from? Read it. This is the spirit okay. of Antichrist. So John de John defines it again. Well, this one says this. Is that spirit of Antichrist? Yeah, that spirit yeah. of Antichrist. Yeah. All right. By the way, note this. Note the connection between these two things. He who denies and he who does not confess. All right. If you don't confess him, you might as well deny him, right? To not confess Christ is to deny Christ, mm -hmm. right? So, in essence, John is still saying the exact same thing right here, isn't he? In chapter 4, verse 3, he's talking about the same thing. He's talking about chapter 2, verse 22. All right? Last mention. 2 John, I believe it's in verse 7. Second John, verse number 7. Ryan, you've done such a good job of reading. Why don't you just keep it up, brother? What? What does he do? 
doesn't confess the coming of Jesus. Ah, there we go. Does not confess that Jesus came in the flesh. And John says, if that's, if that's who you are, what are you? Antichrist. <clears throat> so in all of these texts that specifically mention Antichrist, it all has to do with people who deny who Jesus is and what Jesus is. Does that make sense? If you deny who he is, the Christ, or what he is, <coughs> come in the flesh, you're Antichrist. You're not the Antichrist. You're just Antichrist. Now let me let me shed just a tiny bit of light on this and I'll turn you loose. John wrote these epistles late in the first century. Alright? And there was at that time a doctrine or a group of people known as the Gnostics. And they denied the idea that Jesus could come in the... It, they couldn't wrap their minds around the idea that Jesus could be God and man at the same time. So what they did was they denied that he was ever a man. They basically said anything that appears for Jesus to be a man didn't happen. It was just an illusion. Because God can't be flesh, therefore Jesus can't be flesh. And so they developed this doctrine known as Gnosticism, or this group, they became known as Gnostics, the Knowers. And of this group, they denied that Jesus actually, because they couldn't wrap their mind around God died. So they denied everything about Jesus being in the flesh. And so John is, John is refuting head on this idea that Jesus never came in the flesh. By the way, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 14, he says the Word became what? Flesh and dwelt, Flesh and dwelt among us. You know, he's the only one to make a statement like that. That's explicit. Well, also, now, Paul made it in Philippians 2 that he took on the form of the servant. Right, you've seen God. Right. And the Hebrews writer says that Jesus took on the form of a man. You know, was made a little lower than the angels. But John made the express statement, Jesus came in the flesh. Came in the flesh. And I think John's gospel even recognizes that, that this was a problem for some in, in the realm of Christianity at that time. There, in other words, there were, there were heretics in the early church that were developing false ideas and doctrines about Jesus because they couldn't wrap their mind. And by the way, I'm not saying I can wrap my mind around it. I'm not going to say I can wrap my mind around Jesus being God and man because I can't. But I do know this. The Bible teaches it. <laughs> and if the Bible teaches it, whether or not I can understand it or explain it, it doesn't make any difference. I believe it. I mean, I know that the blood of Christ is applied to my soul when I obey the gospel. Now, you're going to ask me to explain that? No. You better not. But that's what the Bible says happens. That I'm washed from my sins in the blood of Christ. And so, uh, so the inability to understand or, or wrap one's mind around a difficult concept is no reason to, to teach error. And that's what these were doing. And so... All these references to Antichrist had to do with people who were denying who and what Jesus was. And anybody that's against, anybody that denies that Jesus of Nazareth is God in the flesh and the Christ, the Son of the living God, is Antichrist. Every Muslim walking this planet is Antichrist. Every Muslim. They're against him. Are Muslims for Christ or against him? They're against him. Every Jew for Christ or against him? Against him. Every Hindu, against him. Every Buddhist, against him. It's, it's a very simple biblical concept, but because people have concocted all these fanciful fantasies about pre, this premillennial doctrine, they just, they just ignore the simple teaching about what Antichrist really is. It's like, why do people keep talking about the Antichrist? Well, don't ask me, ask them. 
That's what I always tell you. Y'all, y'all always do that to me all the time. Why do people believe that? I don't know. Don't ask me. Ask them. I don't believe it. There's always been people that didn't believe in Christ. Ma'am. Sure, and they and what are they? Antichrist, Antichrist. All right, any questions? All right, we'll come back to this, not this specifically, but I, I do want to come back to some of this idea about Revelation and when it was written, and that'd be a good place for us to pick up, just as a means of, of explaining some of this, and that'll be on the twelfth. On the twelfth. Again, next Sunday's meet, eat, and meet. Next Sunday uh, after that is a budget talk. And then the 12th, we'll come back and look at uh, when Revelation was written. All right, any other questions? All right, if not, I'll ask you to be on your feet. And our brother Ryan.